Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. Dr. Paul is still traveling, so I will do my best to man the helm in his absence. Thankfully, again, I will not be manning it alone or personing it alone. Uh, I have a, a guest, my old friend, Phil Giraldi. Uh, Phil is a former CIA officer, as most of you know, and a prolific writer. He's the executive director of the Council for the National Interest uh, and uh, is very knowledgeable in the Middle East f through his many careers. Uh, Phil, thanks so much for being with us again. Well, thank you for having me on again. That's great. Well, we're going we're gonna to kind of do something different. We're just going to try to do some, some lightning rounds because there's so much happening. And the main topic, I think, is Iran. But I'd like to preface it by saying as we, as we speak, sort of, uh, uh, Mike Pompeo and Sergei Lavrov have met in Sochi in Russia. It's a pretty important meeting. Uh, as you said uh, off camera, we're not sure what's going to happen, so we can't speculate too much. There is a quote here from Pompeo. <clears throat> I can almost hear the grudgingness in his voice when he makes it. <laughs> I, I am here today because President Trump is committed to improving this relationship. I hope we can find places where we have a set of overlapping interests and can truly begin to build out strong relationships. Doesn't seem like he's too thrilled, but we don't put too much into it. I think one of those areas that <clears throat> is possibly something they are talking about, let's hope at least, is Iran. And that comes to our, our topic for today in the context of the, of the Trump, uh, or of the Lavrov Pompeo meeting. And there are a couple of things in the news uh, this past week, uh, Phil, that I think are pretty troubling. And I want to try to see if you can help us unravel them with your vast experience. Uh, the first one was when Bolton came out a few days ago, as you remember, and said, I heard a plot, I heard a plot. Uh, Intel people are telling me that the Iranians are ready to attack us or our interests. So I've, I've ordered our uh, carrier group, Abraham Lincoln, uh, to go up on their border, and I've ordered some B-52s. Of course, he doesn't command the military, but he certainly thinks he does in his mind. Um, <clears throat> we find out later that this uh, unsubstantiated threat, pretty vague and open-ended, may have come from our old buddy Netanyahu, and in fact, the carrier group was already scheduled to go there. So maybe some Bolton bluster. Uh, but what do, you, what do you make of this? What do you think they're on the lookout for? The trigger seems to be fine-tuned to where it's almost a hair trigger. Yeah, I think the hair trigger is absolutely the key to all this. This is, uh, uh, I don't necessarily see a false flag operation coming, but I do see a sustained um, attempt on the part of the United States and Israel to provoke Iran into making uh, what might be regarded as a mistake uh, by possibly attacking a, a U.S. vessel uh, in the Persian Gulf or uh, any number of scenarios playing out in, in Syria, playing out even in Lebanon. Uh, there are a number of things that can happen here. But uh, there clearly is a, um, an intention on the part of some people in the administration to have some kind of war with Iran. And uh, I think that's undeniable at this point. And, uh, and all these provocations at a certain point uh, will pull on that hair trigger. Yeah, and you know, uh, Pat, Colonel Pat Lang, who I have a lot of respect for and does a lot of great writing analysis, he basically said what you just said. He put out something just uh, before we started the show. Uh, he, 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 uh, here's his conclusion, essentially. In my opinion, the neocon squeeze with regard to Iran is in high gear. The aim is probably to pressure Iran until they lash out somewhere against U.S. forces or interests. Trump would then be urged by the madmen in the White House to order the armed forces to attack. I think that's uh, a, a pretty good analysis, and it, and it ties in with what you say. That brings us to topic number two, then, which is these four tankers. We're not seeing a lot about it which makes me, as you say, suspicious that it's not a U.S. false flag or the obedient media would be out there. Media is pretty quiet. Uh, the, uh, the Iranians say it's just Israeli mischief. A few unnamed U.S. officials have said this looks like something Iran would do. Uh, do you think this is a significant event or w what's going on here? Well, this, I, I suspect this could be precisely the kind of uh, stage incident that we're talking about. Um, there, you, you know, you, in, in these kinds of cases, you always have to go back to who benefits. Um, Iran, I, I don't think, benefits in any material way by uh, provoking uh, neighbors that are already hostile to it. Uh, Israel, on the other hand, uh, has an interest here, has an interest in making it look like Iran is carrying out 
uh, what might be described as a terrorist act. Uh, so uh, I, I suspect that there's a hand in this. It, it could be Israel. Uh, it could, on the other hand, just be something that uh, uh, the locals there are fooling around with to see what the reaction would be. You know, the, I don't know how much credence you put in this uh, organization, the Debka file. I haven't put a lot of credence in it, but it's known to be or suggested to be close to Israeli intelligence. And they put out a report yesterday saying, oh, this is probably the Iranians because they're trying to send a message that they're willing to operate off of their own shore, uh, that they have a broader range. Uh, do you think there's uh, anything to that? Well, first of all, Debka is definitely Israeli intelligence. So whatever you're seeing there is a, a point of view being uh, put forward by the Israelis in this case, to state flatly that it is a, an Iranian action. Um, no, it doesn't make much sense. I mean, the, uh, everyone who is a neighbor of Iran knows within certain limits what Iran's military capabilities are. And the military capabilities of, of Iran are significant. Uh, they have missiles that can reach all those targets. Why they would have to fool around in doing something like this uh, with ships that are, are basically in harbor it doesn't make any sense to me. It didn't do any damage. I think there wasn't any oil in the ships, and it wasn't a lot of damage. But, and I'm not an expert in this film. Maybe it's, it's not something that you're that interested in either. Is this something that the MEK could try to pull off? They're, they're, they're good at stirring things up. Uh, I think this would be a step too far for the MEK. They, uh, they have the ability, they have, they have proxies inside Iran that have the ability to go up next to someone's car and, and shoot uh, shoot the driver, um, but they don't really have a lot of support or infrastructure in Iran. Apart from that, and this would require uh, considerably more capability than I think they have. Now, John Bolton would, would probably let them use the USS Abraham Lincoln uh, as a launching pad, but we're not at that point yet. Well, they did give him 40 grand for a speech not long ago, so... <laughs> Uh, so let's move on to, to number three, you know, on the Iran file for this week. Uh, President Bolt, I mean, uh, National Security Advisor John Bolton, ordered the Pentagon, according to reports, to come up with a new plan for President Trump to attack Iran. Um, very helpful of him just doing his job. Uh, the uh, options include, on the far end, stationing some 120,000 U.S. troops in the Middle East, and that doesn't suggest, according to reports, a ground attack, which they say would require a lot more, but just sending another 120,000 over there to send a message. What's, what's Bolton up to here on this, Phil? What do you think? Well, you know, uh, in a sense, these people are, as you correctly point out, this is far too few in numbers to actually consider fighting Iran on the ground. I mean, it would take probably something like three or four times that number. Um, so this is, uh, again, it's a provocation, first of all. And secondly, uh, these these uh, soldiers uh, who are going to be sent to the region, I'm not sure where they would physically be sent to in the region. Kuwait, I guess, Qatar. Um, uh, these people would, in a sense, be um, uh, hostages. They'd be sitting ducks if, uh, if some kind of fighting does break out. And possibly it's uh, uh, Bolton's intention to have enough targets in the area where something will happen. And, of course, yeah. this is uh, the kind of thing that all of us should be quite afraid of, because this would be uh, blundering into a war that no one but, but Bolton and Pompeo and their friends in MEC and APAC really want. And uh, uh, it would be a catastrophe for the region, catastrophe for the United States. So put Iran in a small enough box so when it moves, something will break and something will happen. And that makes, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, absolutely. That's right. And it makes me wonder about, uh, and this is outside of our four points, but it makes me wonder because, you know, when Bolton talked about this unspecified intelligence, he was very vague about how U.S. interests and U.S. allies uh, being attacked by uh, proxies from Iran. And it makes me wonder because I was looking at some news reports this morning about the Houthis using some drones to attack some Saudi targets. And of course, as most people who are objective and have a brain realize that the Houthis are responding to Saudi aggression. Uh, but do you, you know, the neocons have already established in the U.S. that essentially the Houthis are an outcropping of Tehran. 
So it seems to me like Bolton has set it up, whereas if the Houthis defend themselves against an aggressive Saudi Arabia, aha, now we have our Iran meddling and, and harming our allies. Do you think that's one of the, the hairs on the trigger, Phil? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think it's bigger than that because obviously you're looking at a, a number of different or possible scenarios in Syria. And uh, let's not forget Lebanon. Uh, these are all places where something can be kind of construed in a way as to indicate that the uh, uh, Iranians are, first of all, supporting terrorism, and uh, they're also supporting uh, groups that are uh, hostile to um, existing regimes in, in the region. So there are a lot of ways to play this. And uh, Bolton is not particularly expert at this, because obviously the, uh, what he's doing is so obvious. But the point is, is it obvious to Donald Trump? Uh, yeah. What really uh, bothers me about Trump is that uh, Trump is prone to make decisions without any real information in terms of what is happening and what it might mean. And, and I would cite particularly the uh, cruise missile attacks on Syria, yeah. which took place with, uh, based on bad information and it should have been a kind of information that should have been seen as being fabricated uh, from the beginning. <laughs> and yet we had acts of war carried out by Donald Trump just to send a message. And what about the reports that, uh, the, that actually Trump is, doesn't receive his daily briefing from the CIA as is customary, but rather Bolton will meet with them and then deliver tr to Trump what he thinks Trump should hear? I mean, that seems to be pretty dangerous as well. Yeah, I've heard from friends in CIA that that's absolutely true, that uh, Trump has no interest in, uh, in uh, intelligence. And uh, when he, he does uh, meet with an actual uh, uh, CIA person for a briefing, uh, he insists that they keep it keep brief and uh, limit it to one paragraph. Uh, <laughs> So the, the, the depth of, <laughs> of perception at the White House is something that we might want to consider. <laughs> Maybe it has some pictures as well. Well, let's, let's turn to the, our last round, and we're going to have a bonus round if we have time. I think we might. But speaking of the CIA, and I know that you, you, you've, you, know, you, you certainly understand what this is all about, and uh, I've been trying to understand it. It seems on, on, one, on, in, in one, on one hand, suspicious and reminds us of 2002. But what do you make of Bolton's recent trip to the CIA? They say that there's special intelligence there uh, on Iran that can't be seen anywhere else. Apparently, I believe Pompeo, Gina Haspel, the CIA director, was there. Maybe Mike Pence, if I'm not mistaken. Does this smell fishy to you, or is it being overplayed? It's, it's, a, it's a strange uh, story. Uh, the, certainly, national security advisors vice presidents, uh, people other than the president, uh, have in the past gone over to CIA to see certain types of presentations. I wouldn't characterize it at, as, as intelligence, but it's more it's um, when you go over, you're treated to the dog and pony show, which brings in analysts, which brings in uh, video, which brings in uh, all kinds of material that would be difficult to replicate um, at the White House. So I, I think that's what it is but what bothers me is that that bolton is playing the leader on a lot of this stuff yeah and uh, and clearly his instincts are are pretty bad um what and of course haspel haspel as far as i'm concerned is a cipher i mean she's not uh, she barely escaped uh, getting crucified in her her hearings <laughs> to get approved for the position and uh, she has a lot of baggage so this is a this is a person who basically would uh, would be willing to accommodate a guy like Bolton as much as uh, he wants. Uh, so it's uh, uh, Bolton is a scary guy. Uh, Pompeo, I think you can characterize it a different way. He's just an idiot. <laughs> but uh, do you uh, think? But uh, Bolton is is serious, scary. Yeah, yeah, and determined as well. I mean, there was an interesting profile I think in the Atlantic about his background. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the dog and pony show does it go both ways? Because you know, we had heard for so long that in the run up to the Iraq War that Cheney would go to the CIA, and it wouldn't be to, to receive the dog and pony show. It would be to twist arms and to tell analysts, hey, listen, here's the conclusions. You better make sure that your analysis fits. Would, it, would there have been, do you think, would there have been analysts in there who would be susceptible to pressure from Bolton? Well, we're talking about two different worlds. We're talking about basically 
the immediate 9-11 world when there was still a lot of old school analysts who were not willing to have their arms twisted. Yeah. Uh, but today, the CIA is a and uh, it's been heavily politicized. Um, people basically are promoted on the basis of, uh, of saying the right things politically. There are certainly some honest analysts. I would never deny that. But these aren't the guys that are going to be promoted and put in front of a Bolton or, um, or a Pompeo. Uh, these are the guys that are in the back room, you know, kind of pounding away on their computers and uh, <laughs> never to be seen. They never seen the light of day. Right. <laughs> well, let's, let's do a bonus round because I just saw this before we went on, uh, Phil, and uh, I, I just you know, want to know your, your opinion of it, I guess. I thought it was a pretty good tweet from Tulsi Gabbard, and of course, we're not in the business of endorsing anyone, but she is running for president on the Democrat ticket. Uh, and I thought this was a pretty good one this morning, pretty gutsy. She said, Trump says he doesn't want war with Iran, but that's exactly what he wants, because that's exactly what Saudi Arabia, Netanyahu, Al-Qaeda, Bolton, Haley, and other neocons, neolibs want. That's what he put first, not America. That's pretty tough language coming out of that candidate, don't you think? Sure, and I would add a lot of uh, her fellow Democrats uh, in with that group that uh, want war with Iran. It's, this is not uh, a partisan issue. Um, I, I, I'm able to endorse Tulsi. Uh, I like her a lot. I, I wish her success. I would like to see her run for president. She's the only candidate that is speaking in serious terms about war and peace. And, and that should be the number one issue for, um, for most everyone. But everyone else is just kind of a, a con job. I mean, uh, can you imagine uh, President Biden? Uh, <laughs> I mean, Hillary, Hillary would be the secretary of war on the second day. You know, it's, uh, it, it's just incredible. Yeah. I think Trump is probably praying for Biden and probably dreading Tulsi because she's everything he's not. But I think Tulsi is probably smart enough to understand that running on a peace ticket wins. I mean, that's exactly what Trump did. Why not get along with the Russians? Stop these stupid wars. And that energized people in the same way that, that Ron Paul in, in two races energized people with talk of peace and and prosperity. So let's hope she keeps it up. They're going to try to ignore her, but uh, at least the, the debate is slightly interesting with, with, with her out there doing it. Um, Phil, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Your terrific insights. You can, uh, our audience can find Phil's writings on the UNS Review, Strategic Culture Foundation, American Herald Tribune. He's writing everywhere. I don't know where he gets the energy, but it's always insightful controversial, good stuff, cutting edge stuff. So seek out Phil's stuff. We'll put some links uh, in the description so you can follow Phil's writings. Phil, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me on. And thank you to our audience for watching the Ron Paul Liberty Report.